for the benefit of the recording, we are uh, in chapter four of Ruth, um, and Obed has just been born and named. Now, the story is complete. Naomi went away full, she came back empty, but now she's got a fullness she never dreamed of. She has a son, she has an heir, and the women tell her she has Ruth, who is better for her than seven sons. And her life has been redeemed. Now, when you go and teach a book, or you study a book of the Bible, you want to ask yourself, what is the main theme? And I've been back and forth on a number of these things, but I think this is the theme. The theme is redemption. Yes, I got it that it's being recorded. Thank you. Okay. Redemption. I think that is the overriding theme of the book of Ruth. Matter of fact, I think it's the overriding theme of the Bible and of life. Now, the, the, the theme of redemption wants to tell us through this story about the process of redemption and what is involved and about the nature of the Redeemer. We'll see why that is as we go along. First of all, there's the process of redemption. What does it mean to redeem? We have the example of depicted by Naomi's story is you buy back what was sold off. Her farm, her inheritance was sold off. And you get to buy it back. You restore what has been lost. Her family has been restored. Her possessions now, she's beginning to get them back. To heal what is broken. Think of a relationship to God was broken because of her depression and because of her, her bitterness and, and her loss. And that has been restored. We saw that as she began to change and soften under the influence of Ruth's love and God's grace in her life. And uh, she's been restored to her people. Where she had gone away and lived in Moab, now she's back among her people. And then to bring to life what is dead was dead for Naomi. I think her hope was dead. She didn't think she had a future. But most important, her family line was dead. I want to make, see if you understand this. The greatest calamity that could befall a person in this culture was for your line to go extinct. In other words, for uh, well, it's kind of like we're seeing in Europe today. There's, there's inverted pyramid families. You have four grandparents, two parents, one child, and then the rest. And when you get to that point where your line goes extinct, they believed that salvation in the afterlife was related to your progeny. In other words, you die, but you live on in your family. Now, right or wrong, that was a very, very strong belief in the Middle East in that time. Alvin. Right. Right. If, for example, if you died without an heir, somebody bought up your farm, your inheritance ceased to exist. Gone. Jubilee, nothing that made no difference because the creditor bought your farm. He now owns it. It is his inheritance and you're done. And the same thing is true with an heir, your family. You do not continue to live on through your children if, you're, if you have no heirs. Glenn. Property issue. We have, we have an eternal issue here dealing with God's promised covenant of salvation yet to come so if your bloodline is gone then it never gets to happen i think that's what they did i'm not sure that's true for them i mean if, if a person was a follower of god if he was uh, one of god's people um his salvation did not depend on his children but they believed it did they believed that you would live on in your children so she was her, her life was dead and now it's come back to life in the, in, the, in the body of Obed. Now you'd think, hold it, hold it one more thing. <laughs> the, the theme of redemption is about the process of redemption, but it's also about the nature of the Redeemer, which is something we need to learn and we need to understand. And Boaz 
gives us this nature of the Redeemer. Naomi's experience is all about what it means to be redeemed. Boaz's experience, Boaz's character is, is about the nature of the Redeemer. And just, we went through this before, but I just want to cover it real quickly again. First of all, he's worthy. Now, that term, a worthy man, well, he, he's, he's got standing. He's, he is, uh, has a right to redeem it. He also has the money. He can afford it. He has the resources to redeem. Uh, and then he's willing. He doesn't have to, but he is willing to redeem. He's willing to pay the price at his own cost and redeem the, whatever is that's been lost. He will bear the cost himself. He dispels fear. Now, these things uh, below that line are just sorts of things that this Redeemer exhibited in his character. Remember the way he treated Ruth when she was basically just this poor girl that was out in the field trying to pick up a few uh, strings of grain. And he, he dispels her fear. She says, you have set thy heart at ease by speaking kindly to me. Who am I that you should pay attention to me, a Moabite, a former enemy? So he, he, he dispels our fears. He, he invites us in. Remember, he had her come and eat at his table with his workers. She became not the foreigner, the former enemy, not the poor homeless um, waif, but rather now she's part of the crew. Not necessarily the family, but part of the crew. And she found refuge among his laborers and his women. And, God, and, and he speaks kindly to her. That's a great characteristic of the Redeemer. Um, he provides refuge. Remember, uh, Boaz provided protection. He said to his men, don't let anybody touch her. Don't you. Leave this lady alone. Let her glean safely. And by the way, um, give her a little bit of extra. Sloppy. She's poor. She has nothing. Uh, give her a little bit extra. Leave some more behind for her. Provides refuge, provision, protection, and sustenance for the needy one. Uh, he gives his pledge. Do you remember that? He gives his pledge uh, once he decides that he will be the redeemer. She proposes to him, and he says, I will. And as a pledge, what did he give her? He gave her six measures of grain, which was about anywhere from 60 to 90 pounds. So he had to help that up, help it on the sack on her back, and she took it back to Naomi, abundantly provided for by this uh, pledge of the future. And he, that, that says, I will do it. I will carry it to completion. And in chapter 3, verse 18, Naomi says to her, don't worry, you sit still now, because he's not going to rest until this is done. This pledge promises to carry it out. He satisfies the law. Because the idea of redemption involves a legal proceeding. If something's been sold off, it has to be bought back. There's got to be a closing. If something's been lost, it has to be found and restored. And so he satisfies the law. He overcomes all the legal obstacles. And the thing I really love about the nature of this Redeemer is that he is generous. Remember, when he invites this poor woman just to sit with his laborers, and he lets her eat at the table and... She had access to the water, and she ate till she was full. Probably hadn't had a full meal like that in a long time. Not only that, she stuffed some in her pocket to give to Naomi. And then he, he, he left a little bit extra grain behind, and she was able to glean about 30 pounds and take it back to Naomi. And Naomi was amazed. You don't get that kind of, that kind of a blessing from picking up a few aluminum cans. That's, not, that's, a, big, that's a big harvest. So he, uh, he is abundantly generous. And I think the fact that it, when, he, when he accepts her proposal and he says, I will redeem, that uh, and he gives her six measures, what's the number of completion? Seven. Six says there's more to come. More to come. And indeed there was. So that's the idea or the theme that comes through this story. And remember, I think I said at the beginning, literature, stories, impress us far more than just simply making statements. We, we don't just look at this as a redeemer, but we think about Boaz and the whole story of how Boaz related to Naomi and Ruth. And we say, wow, that's what a redeemer's like. So you'd think, all right, everybody lived happily ever after. This is the end of the story, right? But it's not. Instead of finishing the story, what do we get? We get genealogies. How many here enjoy studying the genealogy? Not a few. 
I was having breakfast with Todd uh, this past week, and I was mentioning to him this, this thing, this idea of genealogy. He said, oh, man, I've learned so much studying genealogy. I said, Todd, you're a kindred spirit. This is wonderful. So-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, whose name you can't pronounce no matter what you do. A lot of people think that they don't know why they're there, but they are, they're important. And you can get a lot from studying them. <laughs> Matt Ford says that genealogies are the place where all Bible reading plans go to die. Right? Well, that's not the case, really. But, uh, so the, what's the point? Why, why do you provide these genealogies? Well, I think there's a really important story uh, reason. It is probably the most important thing about this. This writer now is connecting the story of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz to a much, much bigger story. See if I can give you an understanding of that. The story now merges into what you might call the true super story of the world, what philosophers and thinkers call the meta narrative of the world. And think of this meta narrative as the big story. And Ruth's story is this little tributary uh, going into the river of the big story. And it emerges and it adds to the river, and then it also gets propelled along with it. It may be hard to fully understand, but, but let me just first ask you the question, what is a meta-narrative? What's a meta-narrative? It's the grand narrative in which everything else has meaning. Ooh, oh, you got it. <laughs> it is the story... What I call the super story, the one that looks like it's above that within which every other story fits and makes sense and has meaning. Meta narrative is the grand story that gives meaning to all the sub stories in the world. It's the one that answers all the big questions Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? What's going to happen to the world? Does anybody love me? Is there hope for me? All these big, very important, do I have importance? Am I secure? Is there meaning to life? Is there, or is this just a, just a, what is that uh, Shakespearean thing? Full of sound and fury and signifying nothing. That's what some people think life is, but no, this is a story. Now, in the past, Western civilization has tried to make a meta narrative out of something besides God's word. We've tried reason. Matter of fact, beginning back in the Middle Ages, it was believed, and especially in the Enlightenment, we do not need revelation. That's just a lot of old stories. What we really can do, we really need is to take reason, and through our reason and philosophy, we can determine the truth. And we can find a story that explains everything. Except that everybody's story is different. Nobody agrees. Every philosopher debates with every other. And the only thing that reason has given us is a lot of isms and the horrors of the last century under socialism, Nazism, communism, fascism. All of the isms haven't turned out well, have they? No, they have. Well, then we decided, well, since reason's not doing so well, we're going to use science to give us a meta-narrative. Meta and if it's scientific, then, then it's true. And that is kind of where you and I grew up. It's called the modern program. This is modernism. We, we believe that science, if it's scientific, it can answer anything. As a matter of fact, when I was a kid, uh, there was some legislation passed that forbid advertisers on, uh, on commercials uh, to, from using white lab coats because they were not scientists and people would think they were, and then that would give them credibility they didn't deserve. Science, if a scientist tells you that, Anthony Fauci is science. What he says is true. Yeah. But the problem is, science keeps changing. Science doesn't always give the same answers. Science can tell us how to build a nuclear weapon, but it can't tell us why we should or shouldn't drop it on somebody. And it's utterly inadequate. And so we've really come out of the modern era, and our culture now lives in what we call the postmodern era. Has a different meta narrative. What's the meta narrative of postmodernism? And you're not allowed to talk. <laughs> <laughs> What's the meta narrative of postmodernism? Anybody know? 
if it's right for me, it's right for you. And, okay. Relativism. Relativism. You're close. Yeah. The, 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 the overriding principle of the postmodern is that there is no meta narrative. There is no meta narrative. There is no story that makes everything work. So instead of receiving the truth about ourselves, oh boy, Kyle was great this morning. What did God make me? He made me a man. That is the truth about me. But instead of receiving the truth that God has given us about ourselves, we decide we'll make it up. I feel like a woman. I'm white, but I, I identify as black. I can change whatever. I can be whatever I want to be. I am going to live an authentic life. Do you remember Storm Large? I had her clip up there, 52-year-old woman trying to pretend she's 20. And she gets up there and she says, I just want to expose myself to the world and let them see how authentic and genuine I really am and the real me that's inside. Yeah, but the real me that we manufacture inside isn't the real me. I love the way Matt Ford puts, puts things in very succinct ways. Some of the, some of the phrases he uses, I just, they're going to stick with me for a long time. But he said, the world's great error is to believe this big lie. God is not good. His word is not true. We should replace them both with something else. And we replace God with our idols, our isms, our things. Or we replace his truth with whatever comes from within. That's postmodernism. Leonard. Example of that is Harvard University, who is probably the primary purveyor <coughs> of, of relativism, relativism in the postmodern society. And yet, in their statutes written in 1636, it says, To know God and Jesus Christ is the end of all knowledge. Now, look at where they are today based on what their statutes were and their founding was based on. Western civilization has been built on a biblical meta narrative. You go back into the earlier days of our, our nation and you would find that the people were very biblically literate. They understood that we came from God who created us. They understood that God is a judgment awaiting all men. They understood that we were fallen men and women into sin and that we uh, can be redeemed. They, they understood all that. But we have come to reject that. And by rejecting a biblical meta narrative, a biblical worldview, the results have been horrible. You look at the last century, and what's going to happen in the coming century has got us all pretty scared, right? So the Bible, and we should say this and, and hold on to this with total affirmation, the Bible is the one true and complete meta narrative that makes sense, that answers the big questions, and has the power to save us. And I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul says. And we need to say the same thing unashamedly to anyone we're dealing with. We have no reason to reject this wonderful story that God has given us from the very beginning, creation, to the end of the great judgment. <laughs> there you go. God created us in his image, just as Kyle said this morning. It was wonderful. And then we fell into sin and then the entire universe is alienated from God. He is a judge for he has judged the world once and he will judge it again. He is a savior, his redeemer who came to save us. God the son who died on the cross for our sins. If, if you lose the blood on the cross in your message, you have lost the gospel. And he will come again. And there will be a judgment where God will call to account every secret thought, intent, word, and deed of our lives. And apart from the grace of God given us in the gospel, we are lost. Now, when you real, read the Old Testament and the New Testament and this grand meta narrative that God has given us that takes us from the beginning to the end, you'll find, just like in the book of Ruth, the theme of redemption. Right? Yeah. Because the problem surfaced immediately. The problem is we are alienated from God. God has us, we are placed, you might say, we are born on death row. He says that in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And die is to be separated from God forever. 
in the whole period of this historical narrative is all about bringing people into the world, created in God's image, though they are born on death row, and redeeming those that will respond. And then taking them through the judgment like he took Noah through in the ark through the flood, and taking us to a new heaven and a new earth, which we all wait for. So the subject of this entire meta-narrative is always redemption. And when you talk about redemption, you are talking about the Redeemer, right? So the, the central figure in the meta story of the world, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, is Jesus Christ. And the subject of that entire story is the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. You remember on the road to Emmaus, our class is called Emmaus for a good reason. Because on the road to Emmaus, Jesus, the risen Christ, met with two disciples. He disguised himself so they couldn't understand who he was. And they were asking him questions. And what's the matter with you? you? Didn't hear what's been going on in Jerusalem? My goodness, we thought that this man, Jesus, was the Messiah. And look what happened. He ended up on a cross. And what does Jesus say to him? Jack, Luke 24, 25, 27. How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. You see, everything, in this, what were the scriptures in those days? <laughs> we didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John or anything beyond. We had just the Old Testament. But what does it teach? It teaches about the redemptive work of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he told them all the things that were written about him, how that he would have to come in, uh, in, in suffer before his glory. So everything that we read, and that includes the book of Ruth, is its proper subject. It relates to the shadow of Jesus Christ, that uh, from his work of creation, to his work of redemption on the cross, to his work as the judge and the redeemer of heaven and earth. Now, the rest of the book here in these genealogies will connect uh, Ruth's story into this great river of redemption. And we'll see different perspectives, those of the past, those of the present, and those of the future. And there are three different groups of people which we will uh, look at. The first one uh, in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, are the witnesses in the gate. This is where he's sealed the deal, and the witnesses, they point to redemption past. And then there's the women of the community when the baby's born, and they report, they, they, they discuss pre uh, redemption present. That's verses 14 to 17. And then the narrator at the end, who can't be a contemporary of Ruth since he talks about David, all right? he talks and points to redemption future. And that's verses 18 to 22. So let's go through those and, uh, and, and look at each one of them in turn. The witnesses at the gate. Go to chapter 4, verses 11, 12. Jack? Then the elders and all those at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together build up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Well, the witnesses are pointing to redemption past. The first thing they say is, may you be like Rachel and Leah, who built up Israel. Now, why would she connect this thing to building up Israel? I mean, I mean, you have many children, I understand that, but why would you be like Rachel and Leah, who built up Israel? Why is it important to build up Israel? Well, first of all, I think you've got to remember what Jesus said to the woman at the well. He said, you don't know who you're worship. We know who we worship because salvation is of the Jews. That's something people don't like to hear today. See, you can't avoid this. We got the Bible through the Jews. We got Jesus through the Jews. Salvation is through the Jews. It is important to build up Israel. I, it's fascinating to me when you study the Bible in this great meta narrative from Genesis on that God makes the promise to Adam that this redemptive work will take place, right? He says to the, to, 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 uh, the serpent, he said, uh, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You will bruise his heel, but he, her seed, 
will crush your head. First promise that God gave that said, this will be made right. There is somebody coming. And then righteous Abel was destroyed. And then God raised up Seth, who's called righteous, through whom this Redeemer would come. So God necks it down. He excludes Cain and he puts through, through Seth. And then you go beyond that, you put on your glasses, and the world gets really in bad shape. And then it goes to Noah. And God necks it down some more. Salvation is going to come through Noah and his children. And Noah's uh, prophecy, it says it'll come through Shem. Not Ham, not Japheth, but through Shem. And then, of course, we had Abraham in Genesis 12, where it says, In you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, and I will make of you a great nation. So through this nation that comes from Abraham, it will be, uh, there will be uh, redemption. And then to Isaac, he says, in Isaac, your, your, uh, your seed will be named. And then, remember, Isaac, Rebekah had twins, Esau and Jacob. And God says, I love Jacob, the younger, and I hated Esau. And so he necks it down further to the children of Jacob, who is Israel. And then later, it will say, the scepter will not depart from Judah. Necks it down from the 12 to the one tribe. And then we have later on, down to David. Will be the son of David, and Jesus has come the son of David. Now, I can understand why it's important that they connect this event and their future to this, to building up Israel. Because without Israel, we would have no word of God. Without Israel, we would have no Savior. Salvation is of the Jews. That's the first thing. Second thing is, what about Judah and Tamar? Now, may your house be like Perez whom Tamar bore to Judah. And you might say, yeah, okay. He had a mother and a dad, big deal. There's a story here. And it's quite a story. And I don't have, to, don't have time to tell the whole thing, but um, here's what you need to know. Judah, one of Israel's sons, okay, so one of the, head, the tribes, Judah, in his youth, or when he was younger, was a wicked man. He was a wicked man. And he chose to live amongst and in take his fortune with the Canaanites. Now that's the no-no, right? God said you were to stay away from the Canaanites. You should be separate from them. You should not intermarry. Well, he marries a Canaanite woman. They have three sons and he gets a Canaanite wife for one of his sons. Tamar is her name. Now, the son dies. She's a widow. And Jacob conspires with his sons to cheat her out of her inheritance by violating the law of levy rate marriage. In other words, the brothers should have given her offspring, but they didn't. And her line was, was set to be extinguished completely. And so Jacob was conspiring to do this, cheating her out of her inheritance. Well, then Tamar decides she's going to flip the scales on him, and she turns around and she deceives him, and she ends up playing the role of a prostitute. He goes into her and fathers children by her. When it becomes evident that she's pregnant, Judah comes out and he says, bring that woman out. We're going to burn her at the stake. And she comes out with the proof in her hand that he's the father of her child. And Judah is devastated. And he says, you are more righteous than I. And then Tamar gives birth to twins. And one of these twins, well, she gives birth to twins that are the illegitimate offspring of an incestuous relationship between a wicked Israelite and a Canaanite woman. That's a dysfunctional family. And one of those twins was Perez. May your family be like that of Perez? Oh, really? Well, you got to look at Perez's family, where it went from there. Perez gave birth to, we don't know too much about these guys. But Perez and his son Hezron actually descended into Egypt with Jacob. Hezron was born in Canaan. He was probably very young, maybe even a baby when he came in. Then there's Ram. There's a minute dad. We don't know much about them. But the greatest, one of the greatest characters in Israelite history is Nashon. Nashon was the uh, leader of Judah through the Exodus. He was the prince of Judah, chief among them. And... Um, he was also their sheikh or their commander of the army of Judah all through the Exodus, Mount Sinai, and into the 
uh, the, the book of Numbers in the wanderings in the wilderness up to the conquest. He was the first to bring the sacrifice that came to the temple among all the tribes. He brought the first one. So he was a great man, and he's still to this day lionized by Israelites. His descendants uh, were illustrious. But not only that, once it came time to go into the land, we have Salmon. Now, he married Rahab. You remember who Rahab was? Okay, this was the Battle of Jericho, the first big battle of the conquest. So Salmon was one who went across and fought in the Battle of Jericho. We think that Salmon was one of the spies because it makes such a great romantic story. You know, she, she puts them up, she saves them and says, you saved my family. She puts the little red cord out there. And then, then when they, the walls come tumbling down, the soldiers are going in and killing everybody. Salmon goes running up there, takes her in his arms and off he goes. It's a great story. I hope it's true. I want to meet him. But anyway, uh, Salmon and Rahab, it, just tremendously famous people in Israel. And then their child or their descendant is Boaz. See? May your descendants, may your family be like Paris's line. You have a corrupt and a dysfunctional family source, a wicked, rebellious man, two Gentile women, both prostitutes, one guilty of incest. And God in his grace redeems the things that are broken. He turns them into good, and he brings forth this illustrious line. Isn't that great? Now, that's not all. There's more of the story. When Tamar rebuked Judah for what he had done in front of everybody, he was mortified, and he was grief, grief-stricken, and he said, you are more righteous than I. And I think this is when he began to change. Because we see later on, when they go down to Egypt to get grain from Joseph, remember that? And Joseph's messing with them, and he says, I'm going to keep that young one, Benjamin, he's going to stay with me, you go back to your father. and can bring, bring me news that, uh, that he's still alive, and, and I will let you go. And of course, they couldn't think about that. And Judah's the one who stood up and said, take me as a substitute. For this boy because if he doesn't go back to his dad his father my father will surely die wow there's been a change in his character hasn't it? but it's not all either you go to the end of jacob's life he's down in egypt and he brings his sons in because he's about to die and he pronounces his final blessing on them and when it comes to judah he speaks these words in genesis 49 chapter chapter 49 verse 10. The scepter will not depart from judah, nor the ruler staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it and until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. Whoa! He's not just talking about blessing Judah. He's saying Judah will be the father of kings. No one thought about kings. Kings didn't come for several hundred years later. But Judah that would have the scepter, and it would not part from between his feet. That is to say, from his line until the, the Hebrew word is Shiloh comes. That's where he gets Shiloh from. It's, it's him to whom it really belongs. And the obedience of the nations is his. Who's that? That's Jesus. That's the, that's the Messiah. So here you have this broken, dysfunctional situation, and God has redeemed it, and he gives him the mission of, uh, of kings of, uh, and, and Messiah coming from his line. And of course, Tamar is the same thing. Tamar's line was saved. She was not extinguished because she had children now, even though they were by Judah. But moreover, she now is one of four Gentile women who are mentioned in the genealogies of Matthew 1 and Luke 3, where it talks about the descendants, uh, the, the, the ancestral line of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? Four Gentile women. There are no other women besides Mary that I know of that are in the genealogies of Jesus. There's just four. And they're all Gentile. Not only that, three of them were prostitutes. Some are played prostitutes, but the others were. You had uh, Rahab, Himar, Ruth, who was a Moabitess, was not a prostitute, and Bathsheba. Excuse me, two were prostitutes. Okay, um, so uh, the, the, 
Perez becomes a new source after his family, Judah and Tamar, all messed up. And he starts a new legacy. Is there anybody in here who's ever said that about a new legacy? Anybody I know? Len says it. You know, his, his, his goal in life, his desire for his family, is he wants to establish a godly legacy from this point on. And for those of us who come from difficult situations, let God redeem it and give us a legacy like that of Perez. And that is what they are wishing for Ruth and Naomi and Boaz. May, God, may they experience God's redemptive grace and blessing as Judah, Tamar, and Perez did. That's redemption past. Now we go to the redemption present. The women in town, now we haven't heard from them since the first chapter. And, uh, and so here we go, ver verses 13 through 17. We've read some of them, but let's go ahead and get the whole thing. Chapter 4, 13 to 17. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. They're talking about redemption present. And, and when they're doing that, they're looking at Ruth and Naomi and, and Boaz. They're saying, look at what has happened to you, how God has redeemed you. And they acknowledge that God has done this. God has not left you without a guardian redeemer. They recognize his hand. Notice this is the hand that Naomi had no clue was really showing her love as she left Moab to come back to Israel. God had given her enormous pain to get her out of the, the enemy's territory, to bring her back to the place where he could bless her. And it says, uh, he has not left you without a guardian redeemer. Now, who is he talking about now with a guardian redeemer? I know that Boaz was a guardian redeemer, a goel, but that doesn't seem to be what she's talking about here. Here, here he's saying, praise the Lord, who has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he the guardian redeemer, become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you. So who is it talking about? Obed. So in a sense, Obed begins to fill the role of redeemer as a child of his mother and his grandmother. He will care for them. He will bring meaning to their life. He will give continuity to their line. He restores the sons she lost. He heals her broken heart. He brings life back to the family. He will renew and sustain. Is that redemption? Yeah. Even the baby is, is, is active in this, this business of redemption. Verse 15, then they declare that Ruth is better than seven sons. Now note the, note the change here. Here's a redemption. Ruth was a Moabite. She's a pagan. She serves enemy gods. Not only that, where we place this story in the judges, they have completed not long ago a war to free themselves from Moab's domination. So she's the enemy. She has come from being the enemy to being an indigent in Israel, to being a convert, okay, being the indigent, to being a member of a, a workforce, to being a member of the family. And now not only a member of the family, she is a celebrated lady in Israel. What a difference. And they give her a reason. They make note of the fact that she has shown hesed. This is the steadfast love toward Naomi. Look, I don't understand why, why Ruth was so kind to Naomi. Because I have a feeling Naomi was not a very pleasant woman most of the time. I think she was miserable. She was cranky and complaining. And she just didn't do much to contribute to the family's well-being. Ruth had to take the burden on her, but her steadfast, unchanging love mirrors the steadfast, unchanging love of God to Naomi. And that softened Naomi's heart, and that changed her life, and then God rewards Ruth. Are you and I worthy people through whom the Lord shows hesed to those around us? 
There's a verse in the Bible that says, do not be weary in well-doing, for in due time you shall reap if you don't fail. I think that's a good lesson for us. Uh, the other thing is, is she has filled the generation gap. Remember, Naomi and Elimelech had two sons. And then there's Obed, Ruth's son by Boaz. Well, these two sons are gone. They're wiped out. That generation is gone. And Obed has picked up at the next generation the inheritance of the family. But what, they, what the women say to Ruth is, God has given you someone to fill that generation, and that would be Ruth, who's better to you than seven sons. You lost your boy, but God has given you a girl, a woman, who is better than seven sons. Again, that principle God gives us generous redemption. And, and far more than we could expect. And of course, Naomi could not have expected that God would restore her sons in that way. And you might say that number seven is important because God has done it sevenfold, which is a very typical um, biblical use. And then, of course, at the same time, Ruth has been given a husband she never could have dreamed of. I don't think Melon could hold a candle to Boaz. Boaz is a worthy man. So she lost her husband, and now she gained this wonderful man, Boaz. Redemption present. Now we got a group that talks about, or a person, whoever wrote this, the Jews think it was Samuel. He points to the future. Chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. I'm not going to bore you by reading it. That's uh, so and so begat, so and so begat, so and so. But uh, it's all there. Um, but the interesting thing is, the last person in this verse is Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David. Now that's said twice. You go back to the end of um, uh, chapter 3, I think it is, and it says 417. I've got it written down here somewhere and I just can't catch it with my eye. Thank you, 417. Okay, so you have 417 mentions David, and at the end of the genealogies we see it lands on David. So what it says is redemption plan involves a king. Now, at the end of the book of Judges, we had this famous statement, Judges 21, 25, Jack. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Now, there's an implication about human nature here, isn't there? It's part of that meta narrative. What's wrong with human nature? We're fallen from God's grace. We're separated from God. We're at enmity with him. We're under his wrath and condemnation. And we have within us a fountainhead that just issues forth in all kinds of wickedness. You know, I, 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 I pray for my kids a lot, and I know you do too, and, and it, I tend to always end up saying, protect them from the temptations of the world and the sin around them, but protect them from the sin within them, as well as Satan's attacks from the outside, from sin, self, and Satan, because that's what we really need. We need a strong authority. We need to have a powerful one to lead us because human nature naturally leads to death. Proverbs 14, 12 says, the uh, ways of a man seem... Uh, uh. Go ahead, hon. Thank you. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The brain starts going fast at this age. Uh, and then, now, now, G.K. Chesterton said, that there is no doctrine that can be empirically verified every day other than the doctrine of original sin. And that's really true. And it's all through the Bible. I've given you a bunch of references up here. Uh, we won't go through every one of them, but Psalm 12 says everyone lies to their neighbor. Romans 1, the wrath of God is revealed against the godlessness and wickedness of men. Romans 3 says none righteous, no, not one. Second Timothy, terrible times in the last days. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. There's none that does righteousness, no, not one. And we could go through the Bible over and over and over again. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So we desperately need a king. And the reason is that we naturally do evil. We have a human nature that will not change and does and is sinful. But also, we are limited and finite. We aren't wise. We don't have all knowledge. God says, my, my ways are above your ways, as high as the heavens are above the earth. Yet we live today in a world that thinks that we are perfectible. All we need is more education. All we need is 
better social conditions. All we need is better economic conditions and the goodness of mankind will flourish. We can perfect man. We just need to put the right principles in place. And we can do that because we are so wise and we have such perfect knowledge. We can change the climate if we think. We can change the sex of our bodies. We are wise enough. Our knowledge has given us an arrogance that is going to destroy us. Now, can't go much further, but to say not just any king, but there needs to be a redeeming king. David was a redeeming king because he was a man after God's own heart. He reigned in righteousness. He redeemed Israel from a wicked king. He brought prosperity and protection. He redeemed Israel from its external enemies. We need that kind of a king. But beyond that, inherent in this word at the end of the genealogy of David comes the Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12 and verse 16. Real quickly. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. Verse 16, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about Jesus, the son of David, right? And so this genealogy or this uh, story fixes this story in the midst of this big Meta narrative between Abraham and Jesus. And it teaches us about what a redeemer is and just what redemption means. Let's just wrap it up. Ruth's story comes in a pattern. I mean, we've gone through this, and I've actually changed my thinking on her as we go through this and study this. These are the phases of her life. Naomi's bitterness. Why? Well, when we, she, she's living in Moab, she's out there and God has taken everything away from her. And then she returns to the place where God is. And he provides refuge for her immediate needs in trouble. And then ultimately he redeems her. That's a pattern we should relate to. When we choose to live outside the will of God, what does it lead to? It leads to bitterness. There's no lasting refuge in enemy territory. You can't stay in Moab and expect God to bless you. But when you seek to return, there will be a separation, the righteous from the unrighteous, a commitment to God, and he will give you refuge. His love offers genuine refuge, and then he will give you the restoration, the healing, and the future that we long for and come from the grace of the ultimate redeemer. I mean, this works on all kinds of levels. Uh, we experience this over and over in our life. We lurch up and we lurch down. You know, we go to Moab and we come back, right? I mean, we, we, we go through all of it, but it's always this. We go to Moab, we experience bitterness. We then return to the Lord. We repent of our sin. He gives us refuge, and then he redeems and changes us and restores what was lost. It's just constantly the same thing. We are actually born in, Mara, in, in, in Moab. This is our salvation experience. We're born on death row. We are, we're apart from him. We live amid bitterness. When we decide to return, there will be separation, born of total commitment. When we are in the depths of despair or trouble, God in his chesed mercy provides us refuge. And then we walk a pathway on the way to his promised land that both reflects his redemption and leads to our ultimate and complete redemption. And lastly, that is also a pattern that fits the meta narrative of the world. That is the true story of the world. In a way, this is the narrative of the universe. The Romans tells us that the entire creation groans in bondage to decay. Why? Because it's enemy territory. Because it's estranged from its creator. It desires to be liberated and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. And then at last, it will all be totally redeemed. Not just those of us who have come to Christ, but the entire creation will be totally redeemed and all things will be restored in the jubilee that is coming at the coming of the Redeemer King, who is the worthy kinsman, the Lord Jesus.